Thank you for joining this TCT AP's highlight session, Chronic Total Occlusion. The utilization of CTO PCI has disseminated worldwide thanks to the advances in devices and growing experience associated with the treatment algorithms. Accordingly, the CTO PCI activity has moved toward challenging more difficult CTOs and toward a more global consensus on what procedural strategy we use to treat them. In this session, two experts will each present the most challenging CTO PCIs they experienced, and it would be informative to follow on how they overcame this situation they faced. Enjoy the presentations and discussions about updated evidence and consensus on the strategic and technical approach to CTO PCI. Please welcome the moderators, Dr. Toshiya Muramasu from Tokyo Heart Center in Japan and Dr. Scott Harding from Wellington Hospital in New Zealand. Hi, uh, and welcome to uh, the highlight session uh, number five uh, for virtual uh, TCT AP. The session is going to focus on CTO PCI, and I'm very lucky to have an expert panel of uh, really well renowned uh, CTO operators. My co moderator is Dr. Maramatsu from the Tokyo Heart Center in Japan. I'm Scott Harding uh, from Wellington Hospital in New Zealand. And on our panel, we have Paul Cow, good friend of mine from the National University of Taiwan Hospital. Uh, we have Dr. Lee uh, from the Asan Medical Center in Korea and uh, Kenya Nasu uh, for Toyohashi Heart Center. Uh, my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Miramatsu, will now introduce uh, the speakers. Okay, uh, hello everyone. And I introduce the first presentations, uh, Dr. Nasu, and the title is My Challenging CTO Case of the Year. Please, Dr. Nasu. Thank you very much, Dr. Miramatsu. So my case is the third attempt to the live CDO. Is a patient is a 70s male. The, he had the, the uh, cabbage the, in 2008. Uh, Lita is patent, but uh, the surplus pain graft has been occluded. So the, he has already the two times the PCA for the light pulmonary CDO, but failed. So EGFR are the 47, LB uh, uh, function is okay. The coronary heart risk factor, the, the diabetes, the, the uh, dyslipidemia, and the hypertension. So this is a control angiogram. Maybe you can see that the very uh, occluded vessel in the uh, proximal RCA. Uh, you can see the some uh, some spilling, but uh, uh, maybe uh, this case is already two times pale. So that this is uh, maybe atherogenic dissection. Something is we can see. And also Lima is okay, so the lady is occluded with this patient. So the main uh, collateral channel from the uh, circumflex is like this. So that you can see the big uh, AC branches mm -hmm. from circumflex to the AV branch. The Lima is fine. So the issue of this case is the occluded saphenous being grafted occluded, uh, connected around there. So that you know, the sometimes from the red red approach, the uh, red red wire is go up to the the occluded saphenous being grafted very easily, and uh, sometimes the anastomosis side is deformed uh, by operation. So this is the simultaneous injection. So you can see the oh sorry, the, you can see the very long CDO is here. So of course, this is a third attempt. So I started from the little grade approach. This is a chip injection from the uh, AC branch. So maybe you can see the two uh, channels. So one is very big, but mature in the very tortuous. And uh, another one is a small, but uh, straight. But the inside of the channel is that uh, you can see the some core screw uh, channels. So anyway, I started from the big one. Uh, but uh, so 03 could not advance it uh, in a mature channel. So I changed the selection of the channel. The, this is a chip injection uh, inside the very small uh, uh, channel. So you can see the some core screw uh, inside of the channel. But after the distal of the core screw channel, 
is a maybe you can see the some bending, but the connection is okay. So I started from this uh, using by the CO03, but uh, cannot connect. Uh, and then it, I changed to the guide wire XDR with a very, very small knuckle. knuckle. So uh, this XDR with small knuckle is, could overcome the, the, this core screw portion. And then finally, uh, XDR is a, could acid the uh, this are the end of the CDO, like this. Yes, the, here is the distal cap of the CDO. So I changed the guide wire to the uh, Miracle Neo 3 gram. So there you can see uh, Miracle Neo 3 advanced uh, somewhere. So anyway, I could advance the wire is like this. So I uh, set the uh, integrate up, uh, integrate system, but uh, you know, is uh, both uh, chip of the guide wire is very far. The line is uh, totally different. So that means in the this red grade level three is inside in the occluded saponous pain ground. So, the, but the, anyway, the, we could uh, detect the anastomosis site and puncture the, the native right coronary artery from the red grade site. So I decided to open the uh, occluded saponous pain graph. So I put the uh, uh, guide area from the undergrade inside the uh, occluded saponous pain graft. And then uh, uh, after reverse cut, um, I could decolorize the uh, saponous pain graft by retrograde, but the uh, retrograde microcatheter could not advance anywhere. So uh, I used the roundabout technique in the guiding and I put the uh, wire is from the underglade and the two of bottom with uh, the guide extension. And then the check the IBUS and uh, I uh, try to puncture the uh, native cor uh, light coronary artery from the little grade side with the IBUS guidance. And the, here is the, uh, uh, from the aerial view is a saponous pain graft and the uh, uh, native light coronary artery overlapped, but uh, this is the little grade nail three inside of the native RCA. So I advanced the uh, uh, wire uh, from both sides and the finally the both knuckle wire is advanced like this. So it is this stage, uh, this situation is uh, already to for the reverse card. But uh, any button could not pass that orifice of the light coronary artery. So I tried it uh, so many buttons, but I could not pass. So the, I changed it. I put the bare rotor wire inside of the light coronary osseum and uh, a 1.25 rotation artery I did. The after rotor uh, drugged me, I could do the uh, reverse cut like this. And then the finally, uh, I could recognize uh, using by the pilot 200 from the red grade. Uh, of course, but the uh, red grade microcast that could not advance the, or, or the distal cap of the CDO. So uh, this is the second time of the, the roundable technique in uh, guide extension. And then I put a uh, balloon and the uh, uh, four stand for the, from the distal to the os orifice. I put the four zayas. Uh, this is a final shot of the, this case. Okay, this is the summary. The full selection, the called the course screw channel, XDR with a small, very small knuckle uh, curve uh, worked well. Uh, to identify the anastomosis side, IBUS guidance was needed and uh, after recolorization of the occluded saponous pain graph. So knuckle wiring from the both side advances CTO side smoothly, uh, but uh, uh, any button could not advance. So I needed a small rotor attract me uh, for uh, to complete the uh, reverse card. Thank you for your attention. Next speaker, Dr. Bridakis. And the title is My Challenging CTO Case of the Year. Thank you so much once again. It is a pleasure to be here and congratulations for organizing an uh, excellent Asia Pacific meeting. And following up on Dr. Nasu's excellent presentation, I will show a case um, that shows how to overcome adversity. 
Uh, the patient uh, had uh, a significant angina. He did have a previous PCI of the LAD with taxo stents. That was many years ago. Actually, that was a failed procedure that led to stent thrombosis, and the patient had had emergent coronary bypass graft surgery uh, with uh, lima to diagonal as well as a saphenous vein graft to the LAD. He also had PCI to the circumflex, and he came back and he now had CTO of the LAD with uh, patent circumflex. And here is the uh, baseline angiogram. There are the old stents within the LAD. The CTO appears to be uh, slightly long. Uh, there is also a bifurcation right within the occluded segment from a fairly large diagonal branch. And the distal vessel is fairly small. However, this is likely due to remodeling over time due to the occlusion. There was uh, an apical collateral branch from the right coronary artery supplying the LAD. So based on these angiographic characteristics, the plan was first to start with undergrade wire escalation. We did have actually a nice outline of the course of the vessel on the previous LAD stand. If it didn't work out, try for the sexual reentry and then uh, keep the retrograde as a third option given some tortuosity and small caliber of the apical epicardial collateral branch. So we tried uh, with uh, several guide wires uh, going undergrade. However, we had significant difficulty advancing through the previously placed stand. Uh, I think there was probably some deformation of the stand that was placed previously. And then eventually, after a long time, we were able to get a wire in the diagonal, but we were unable to get another one towards the LAD and could not advance a microcatheter over this wire including even a dual lumen or a single lumen microcatheter. So at this point, uh, there are different options for uh, going through this uh, balloon and cross-up lesion. Usually the first one is to try a small balloon and uh, the Sapphire Pro is the one we typically use, uh, 1.0. Uh, sometimes we rupture the balloon. We use more techniques to increase the guide catheter support or use different microcatheters. And sometimes laser notherectomy can be used uh, before going to subintimal techniques. But in this case, uh, we tried several things, including the small balloons, getting more support, trying the microcatheter. Unfortunately, we were unable to get through. So we decided to go to the retrograde approach. And then uh, uh, we had some difficulty advancing the guide wire. Um, there was, uh, this is a SUO3 advanced through a Corsair Pro. This uh, collateral had an uh, interesting anatomy. It wasn't uh, fairly tortured, but was going up and then down again and up again. So eventually, after um, uh, some time, we were able to get the wire through and that uh, advanced nicely into the LAD. Um, we did have uh, still difficulty uh, getting through, but eventually uh, we were able to cross two to true uh, with the Pilot 200. Um, and then um, externalized at this point, we were fairly confident we would get a good result. Uh, we ballooned. Um, we had a very hard time to do IVUS, and we like to do IVUS routinely in those instant stenosis cases. Uh, but uh, eventually, we were able to get it through. Uh, we placed um, a 2.5 uh, by 38 millimeter um, more distally, and then more proximally a 4.0 by 15. Um, and uh, after that, uh, we postulated with a 4.0 millimeter balloon. Again, that's LAD in a man, so we didn't think that was a size mismatch. But unfortunately, uh, we did have uh, a perforation. And these are the patients in whom we get very worried because there is the previous coronary bypass. And a perforation like this can lead to loculated effusions and potentially um, very bad outcomes requiring emergency surgery or city guided drainage to prevent uh, loculated tamponade. So like with all, all, all uh, perforations, got a balloon up, uh, gave some fluids. We didn't have to do pericardiocentesis. And then for a large vessel perforation like this one, the cover stand is the solution. But uh, the challenge we had was uh, getting through the previous stands. Uh, those stands are tough to deliver. And actually at the time, we did not have the PK papyrus, which we have now. We only have the graft master, which is a much more complex one to use. And uh, again, this is a large vessel perforation, needs uh, a covered stand. 
Uh, eventually, we were able to deliver a 4.0 graph master and deploy um, across the side of the perforation. But still, it took quite a while uh, to get sealing of the perforation. I think there was some deformation of the previous stents, and uh, that made everything more challenging. But like everything else, if the perforation does not seal immediately, if you get enough time, then eventually it does. And sure enough, in this case, after we gave it several minutes of prolonged balloon inflations, we were actually able to uh, obtain hemostasis. Echo did not show an effusion. And again, we did have a good result. So we were ready to get done with the case. But of course, um, we removed the guide wires and the microcatheter, and now we do have a perforation on the epicardial collateral that we had used for uh, going retrograde. Um, and that's uh, similar to before. You get a balloon up on both sides to prevent uh, bleeding through that area. And then the typical solution is to actually get a microcatheter and then uh, deliver a coil or fat, and coils are usually used for those for more control. And the ones we use mostly in our cath lab are uh, 0.014 coils, so have the axiom coils from EV3, that uh, one can get through any microcatheter, and then once we're happy with the location of the coil, then by pulling the uh, trigger, the release device, the coil can be released into that area. And typically for these perforations, we have to coil from both the uh, retrograde and the undergrade direction. But in this case, we were actually lucky that just placing just one coil um, was actually successful in sealing that area of perforation. So everything went okay. Sometimes in these patients with bypass, we do a coronary CAT scan, a CT scan, to ensure we don't have a loculated effusion. But in this patient, there was no effusion. He did have some chest discomfort for approximately one day, but then that went away before discharge. So I think this case shows some of the challenges with instant CTOs. Although overall, instant CTOs have fairly good success rates, there can be some challenges, such as being uncrossable and using the various steps of the balloon uncrossable algorithm. The second is if everything else fails, going retrograde through the epicardial is the way to go, but that carries the risk of perforation. And in this case, we had both types of perforation, both a collateral perforation, the epicardial collateral, and the main vessel perforation. And uh, essentially, by having a covered stand and a coil was a solution to those problems. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, uh, 10 minutes, the discussion time. And any other questions and comment from the uh, discussant? Professor Kao? Ko Kao? Yes. Yes, Maranasu Sensei. Um, these are two great cases. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nasu, and also thank you, Manos, for presenting these two cases. Um, for Dr. Nasu's case, uh, I had uh, uh, one question for you. Uh, that. Uh, uh, when you cannot travel this corkscrew formation with your uh, SWO03, your next choice is an XTR with a very small bend at the tip, correct? No, 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 uh, no this uh, XTR with a small nug is not my second choice. Usually <coughs> I use the, try to use the shion, Yeah. but uh, I never use the shion block for the, this kind of the corkscrew type of the epicardial channel. Uh, usually the SO3 and the SHIRN and the XDR or the XDR with a small knuckle. Okay, so did you use a, a Sion on this one? Uh, yes. Oh, but still cannot. Yeah, no, no. yes. So then you move to XTR. Sure. Okay, I understand. So do you think in the future there will be a, a, a niche or a, a place for a new wire that is specially designed for this kind of corkscrew formation? Yeah, no, I have no idea. So actually, the shun uh, so three is a very soft, right? Yeah. So the usually the usual the, this kind of the uh, complex channel that we can select it by using by the so three, but uh, actually the we have the some sometimes very difficult case, yeah. right? Yeah, I share the same experience like you. I, I mm. think the problem is that the suo because the distal tip. The, the coil, the spring coil part of it is actually an open coil. So in, in corkscrew conf, uh, configuration, these coils sometimes will be, uh, I mean, at the uh, uh, bend, it's open like like a spring. 
Yeah, so sure. some tissue will be caught in between mm. this spring coil. So I think maybe maybe something with, with like a suo three, but then with a polymer jacket, mm. maybe will help to uh, improve uh, the performance. But I don't know. But uh, when is the wire that has a polymer jacket? Uh, yeah. Usually the chip load is a little bit higher. Yes. 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 So, Paul, just yeah. uh, I'm interested in your experience. I mean, you have a vast, rich, great experience, and and certainly, you know, my experience is that you know sometimes the CO3 because it's so floppy knuckles, and that can be a very useful tool oh. in larger um, epicardial vessels, particularly when there's a branch that you know mm -hmm. it just wants to keep going into the branch. So. Um, and again, in, in, in sometimes tortuosity, a knuckle can be very useful, but I, I've never seen a knuckle in a, in a collateral this small. Um, have you had experience? Well, with the XTR, yes, I do have some uh, experience with a, with a small knuckle through this uh, collateral. Sometimes intentional, but sometimes actually it's just by mm -hmm. chance. So, so that's that's why I'm saying maybe there is a need for a specialized wire in this special condition, because mm. um, I think something like a Sion Black with a lower, much lower tip load, yeah. or something like a Suol O3 with the polymer jacket coating, jacket. yeah. Mm. So uh, yeah, I think it's more safe uh, mm. than the uh, Sion Black, right? Yeah, because black is the tip load is probably too violent. Yeah, I think yeah. so. So maybe we can ask Manus uh, about his case. And uh, I mean, a fantastic case, and you did so well um, to deal with two perforations and not get tamponade and not need to have pericardiosynthesis. So very expertly um, dealt with. But I'm intrigued because you, you did IVIS of the LAD. What mechanism do you think the perforation was in that main vessel? That's a great question. Uh, I think pr probably the problem there, I think that stent was heavily deformed. Mm. So my feeling is there was some calcium and probably the stent strut probably pushed through some part of calcification. And usually for those vessels, the perforation for me happens once you uh, push calcium very aggressively. So retrospectively, mm. uh, I should probably be a little more conservative on the <laughs> sizing which is paradoxical. You think when you have calcium, you may want to be more aggressive. But in those cases, I'm learning from bad experiences that getting a slightly smaller, so maybe 3.5, and don't go 24, 26, but stay maybe 18, 20 atmospheres might be the better way to go to prevent uh, these perforations. Yeah, I think it's a really important lesson. You know, when you have very eccentric calcium like this, um, and you, you often see this when you go subintimal as well, um, that using very high pressures, is not necessarily the right thing to do. And uh, I've been interested in other people's experience, but sometimes I'm very reluctant to go over, say, 14, 16 atmospheres in those sort of situations. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I think in general, what we're learning now is it's better to prepare the vessel as much as possible if you do a therectomy, like uh, in Dr. Nasu's case. Now, of course, in stand, I wouldn't want usually to do a therectomy, uh, but now we do have lithotripsy. So I think eventually uh, cases like this, instead of going high pressure, maybe the better way once lithotripsy is more widely available is to do lithotripsy first, and that can be much safer to expand this. Now, the challenge, though, is that lithotripsy doesn't work as well for eccentric calcium. So if it's eccentric, then it might not be as effective as it would be for concentric calcium. So um, uh, I have one question for maybe um, Dr. Grillak in terms of the Dr. Nasus case. Uh, maybe for some um, CPO experts, uh, for um, the Dr. Nasus case, maybe a candidate for ADR technique because there was a very good distance for the PL and PDA. So uh, if uh, we opt to perform an ADR technique in Dr. Nasus case, there was a, uh, a graft there, the suture at the mid portion of RCA. So uh, will, we, will we have to be concerned of that um, Mastomus sites for the technique. Do we have to, you know, uh, uh, do other kinds of um, evaluation or uh, uh, do some uh, avoid that technique or do the technique? Uh, do you have any um, comments for that? Sure. Well, I think um, the challenge can be if you do undergraded sexual reentry across the touchdown, going through that area subminimally can be very challenging because you have the scar tissue from the previous graft. 
Now, I did notice, however, Dr. Nasu did have a nice CT and saw that there was actually some re-entry zone distal to the touchdown of the vein graft. So there was some area to go further down. But having said that, it's also, it was also fairly diffusely diseased. All the calcium was not concentric. So I think it can be done, uh, but quite often we can spend half an hour to an hour just getting subintimally through the touchdown. The Carlino technique, getting a microcatheter in and injecting slight amount of contrast, we found to be fairly useful in this along with some, uh, um, you know, like the Gladius Mongo, some other stiff uh, polymer jacketed wires that can knuckle very forcefully. The challenge also is in the size of the distal vessel, if it's very small, and I think the case uh, of Dr. Nasu was extremely small distal vessel. I think for those retrograde, it works better in general, because if you go subintimal and you get a hematoma, then it's a very small lumen. It's hard to re-enter into that small lumen. So now we move on to the second sessions. And my presentations, a new algorithm from the Japanese CTO expert registry. So the current CTO algorithm from the Japanese expert registry. So now uh, you can see the history of the PCI for CTO. And since the 1990s, we started in the uh, new guide wire from the Miyako's and a Conquest Pro. And uh, for the uh, power wire techniques and I was guided and the tapering wires and the toners and after that the Corsair and the, and the Stingray systems and the Gaia wire and the final dirigible approach. So this is in my uh, experience of the CTO around uh, uh, 250 CTO cases and half of the Cases was done the resuade approach recently, and the success ratio is around 90% to the 93s. So this is uh, the patient flow chart for the Japanese expert registries. As you, you know, the uh, uh, total uh, end load patient is uh, um, over 9,000 consecutive patient from uh, 2014 to the 2070s. And also Japan is excluded from the, the <coughs> uh, investigations. And uh, CTO in Japan is 6,078 patient. And the uh, current study population is 5,843 patient. And the anti-weight approach is 4,239. And the red weight approach is 1,604 patient. And uh, both uh, categories uh, in the, uh, compared to the primary antiquated approach versus in the primary retrograde approach. And a primary antiquated approach is the uh, 4,281. And uh, uh, anti-guide wire success is 3,204. And the failure is uh, 1,077. The state uh, moved to the rescue retrograde approach 981 patient. And the retrograde success is 689. And the retrograde failure is 292 patient. And the rescue retrograde guide was success is 831 and the technical success is 802 patient. And the primary retrograde approach is uh, retrograde success is 1000 291 and the retrograde failure in the 271. And the primary retrograde approach guide was success 1385 and the technical success is 1349. And this is the patient characteristics. It's a little bit busy, busy slide, I'm sorry. And uh, compared to the uh, primary retrograde approach versus primary retrograde approach. And uh, the guide wire success is a little bit higher in the primary integrated approach and the procedure success also. And the technical success is also the, uh, the higher in the primary integrated approach. And the procedure time is longer in the uh, primary integrated approach, 120, uh, 190 minutes. And also contrast volume is higher 230s and uh, technical failure is a little bit higher in the primary retrograde approach 
13.96%. And the coronary perforation is a little bit higher in the relative weight approach, 7.2% in the 2.8% in the anti weight approach. And the frequent distribution of the guide wire manipulations, as you, you can see, the anti weight uh, wiring, anti weight only, is a little bit faster and the guide wire manipulation time compared to the uh, retrograde approach. And the guide wire crossing time is untrograde. Single wiring is a little bit faster in the more than uh, less than 30 minutes. And the untrograde parallel wiring is still uh, the, the shorter within the 60 minutes. And retrograde, basically retrograde approach and the primary retrograde approach is a little bit a longer time around uh, around 100 and 120 minutes. And this is the invariant much body analysis of the technical success. And the multivariate uh, analysis show us the uh, CTO uh, rings more than 20 minutes is a predictor of the, the technical success and also the severe calcification and the tortuosity of the CTO region and a, a more morphology of the proximal cap and the nose down. And this is a invariant and multivariate analysis of the successful uh, anti-grade guide wire crossing in the primary anti-grade approach and the instant occlusion and uh, we attempt and the tortuosity of the CTO region and the CTO length more than 20 minutes and the morphology of the proximal cap and the nose stump. There are, uh, uh, there are a significant uh, predictor of the, the success integrated guide wire crossing. And uh, this is a new algorithm of the uh, treating CTO. And first of all, the assessment of the CTO region is very important. And uh, high prob probability of the antiquated passage is a uh, JCTO score, zero or instant occlusion. At this moment, in the trying to the primary antiquated approach and the guide wire manipulation within the 20 minutes. So if the, over the 20 minutes, the not succeed, the step move to the next step. Step. The next step is uh, continue to the antiquated approach or switch to the retrograde approach. And the continue to the antiquated approach is uh, move to the parallel wiring or anti-grade dissection reentry uh, techniques. And if the retrograde is not uh, suitable, the final step is uh, uh, IBUS guided to reentry from the antiquated approach. And also the primary retrograde approach is uh, appropriate trying to the uh, primary uh, retrograde approach or switch from the antiquated to the retrograde approach is a uh, retrograde uh, considering. The considering of the retrograde approach is uh, interventional collateral channel, at least one uh, variable. Uh, plus the attempt and the CTO length more than 20 minutes 20 millimeters and the CTO entry type is no stamp. And the anti grade uh, univariate, univariate and the multivariate analysis of the successful guide wire crossing of the quadruple channel uh, crossing in the primary anti grade approach, the CBR region classification. And this is the only one predict predictor of the, the, the successful guide wire crossing from the CC uh, code project channel crossing in the primary activated approach. Thank you for your consideration. Let's move on, move on the next uh, speakers, Dr. Harding, and then comparing the CTO algorithm move, moving toward to the global uh, consensus. Thank you. Um, so as you heard, I'm speaking on comparing CTO algorithms moving towards global consensus. So these are my disclosures. So the first question is, what is the purpose of algorithms? So they're a roadmap for decision-making. They can help standardize and promote best practice. 
They can serve for a reference for teaching and they can provide a platform for discussion. One of the things we need to think about when we're designing a, an algorithm is what's the most important outcome? Is it success? Is it safety? Is it efficiency? Is it cost? Is it durability? All of these things are important, but how you rank them depends on how you write an algorithm. And I would argue to a certain degree that the algorithms that are being written today are focused on success and efficiency. Whereas if you talk to individual operators, often the thing that they say is most important is safety. The other question is, who are we writing algorithms for? Are we writing them for experts, for intermediate operators or beginners? Again, I would argue that uh, algorithms are most useful for people who are earlier in their career, beginners or intermediate operators. And by the time you become an expert, you've probably developed your own style, um, which is uh, less influenced by algorithms. So um, uh, this is the hybrid algorithm with most of you will be very uh, familiar with, a landmark uh, uh, publication by Manus and his colleagues in 2012. And really this was uh, a, uh, a great step forward. Um, it became a sort of a reference point for CTO PCI and had a lot of great uh, uh, ideas encompassed in it. So, the idea that we use dual injections uh, as a standard, uh, the, a standard approach to assessment of uh, the angiogram, uh, anatomy uh, dictating your approach, um, the initial uh, strategy of failing and encourage rapid conversion, and adoption of this uh, algorithm was shown to increase success rates and also be teachable. Five years on, uh, we published the APCTO algorithm, and really this was meant to be an evolution of the hybrid algorithm. Uh, we believe there was a lot of good things in the hybrid algorithm, but uh, it didn't really reflect practice in Asia Pacific, and this was an attempt to move towards a more global algorithm. Um, two years on from that, in 2009, last year, um, the EuroCTO Club, um, as part of its consensus uh, statement on CTO, published this algorithm, which has a lot of similarities with the APCTO algorithm, although they did uh, introduce some subtle variations. So if we look at all three of these algorithms, essentially the same three angiographic questions determine the initial direction, that is antigrade or retrograde. Is the proximal cap ambiguous or defined? Is there a favorable distal target? Are there collaterals that are usable, present or not? How these differ, or one of the major ways they differ, is um, determining the initial approach, whether that's wire escalation or just section re-entry. In the initial hybrid algorithm, occlusion length alone determined this uh, initial strategy. So if it was longer than uh, 20 millimeters, we're into just section re-entry. If it was shorter than 20 millimeters, we're in wire escalation. And the APCTO algorithm, we, we sort of modified this because there'd been a long history of, of wire success in our region. And many operators know that if you have a lesion longer than 20 millimeters, but no other adverse factors, often you can wire that very successfully. So we use a combination of features, length, previous fail attempts, ambiguity, of course, tortuousity, of course, and heavy calcification to decide whether or not um, a primary uh, dissection re-entry, whether it be antigrade or retrograde, should be used. In the EuroCTO algorithm, they had no additional features uh, for antigrade, meaning that most entry, or in general, if you're following this algorithm, you'd be starting with an antigrade wire escalation strategy first up. And in retrograde, they had a lesion length longer than 20 calcification or ambiguity of CTO of course. And if they were present, they encouraged the use of a knuckle wire which puts you in a dissection re-entry um, scenario. So essentially this means that the APCTO and EuroCTO algorithms promote an integrated wiring approach in the, as the first approach in the majority of cases. Interestingly, um, there has been the evolution of the approach of the hybrid operators over time. And this is uh, data from the uh, US hybrid operators from the uh, progress um, registry. I could have shown you other registries. Uh, and where the lesion length was longer than 20 millimeters in 75% of the cases, yet antigrade wire escalation was a primary strategy in 66% of the cases. Clearly, this doesn't fit with the algorithm. This very recently published uh, consistent CTO study from uh, hybrid operators in Europe and the UK. 
And again, uh, the primary CTO approach was integrated wire escalation at 60%, and 66% of cases were longer than 26 millimeters. What does this mean? What it means is effectively that hybrid operators have evolved a bit. If they have a lesion longer than 20 millimeters without other adverse uh, factors, they may well start with wire escalation. What is also really interesting in this is if you have looked at the final approach in this consistent CTO study was integrated wire escalation only 34%. And that two strategies were used in 40% and three strategies in 9% of patients. If you look at their results, they were outstanding. Technical success, 98.6%. Beam duration, just over two hours. Pericosynthesis on 1%, 0% mortality, and a target vessel failure at 12 months of 5.2%. I don't think anyone can, would argue they're not outstanding results. But interestingly, if you look at this, I think what this tells us, it may be that flexibility and the ability to change between uh, strategies may be more important than the first strategy that you choose. Uh, other differences, uh, when we wrote the APCTO algorithm, we wanted to highlight the role of iris guide entry. We felt that was a very important strategy for overgoing, uh, overcoming props ambiguity. This was also incorporated in the Euro CTO algorithm. And to be fair, this has been adopted by many hybrid operators as part of their practice. The Euro CTO algorithm also included a couple of other um, uh, strategies uh, for overcoming proximal cap ambiguity, such as base or scratch and go. Uh, I guess I, the one issue I do have with this algorithm is that they use these things and say it leads to integrated wire escalation, but if you use base or scratch, scratch and go, you enter the sub space and really you're in a dissection re-entry uh, algorithm. Uh, both uh, the APCTO and the European uh, uh, algorithms include parallel wiring. Um, there's a long history of parallel wiring in this region and data from the expert CTO registry from Japan has shown that this can be very successful in the right hands. Both these algorithms also included uh, instructions on when to stop. I think this is a very important safety aspect. We know that as uh, procedures go on in time, uh, success rates go down, complications go up, and we thought it was important to provide guidance on when you should think about stopping and maybe coming back and uh, trying again another day. Uh, the Euro uh, CTO algorithm also introduced the concept of an investment procedure into their algorithm, the idea that maybe before stopping a procedure, you may want to modify things that may make uh, future success uh, more likely. The Chinese have provided, uh, published a CTO algorithm um, which differs in that it uses a table cap as the initial design uh, point of whether you should go integrate or retrograde. Also, if you have a blunt cap, they say that you should use IVIS, and if you can overcome it, then you can use a, an integrate uh, method. Uh, like the hybrid algorithm, they use 20 millimeters lesion length as the determinant of whether you should use a wire escalation or a, a, a dissection and reentry. Uh, technique, and it does include parallel wiring and ADR. We just heard a very nice uh, uh, presentation from Miramatsu Sensei on the Japanese CTO algorithm, which has taken a novel approach um, based on their expert registry and their analysis of, uh, of uh, CTO wiring time, and really uh, trying to look at efficiency uh, as part of the algorithm. I think this is a little bit different in that it's really suggesting that we should be using more primary rich grade approach up front. And I know that Paul Cowell, and we've had discussions about this, is a big fan of this algorithm because it sort of reflects his practice. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, I do have some concerns uh, about this and mainly because I think there's a lot of registry data that says if you're JCTO zero or one, that there is a very high success rate for integrated wiring. And in general, integrated wiring has been shown to be the safest uh, and uh, uh, well, obviously cheapest and can, and can be the fastest uh, method. What was great about the work um, done by uh, the Japanese and was actually looking at efficiency and trying to put uh, a definition on perhaps when we should change. So they use 20 minutes. Um, 
You can argue whether it was optimal or not, but I think it is a way forward um, that we really have to try and define where we should be changing. I think one of the other concerns is how safe is retrograde? If we're going to promote this uh, as a, uh, a first-line procedure, um, uh, we, should we should consider the safety, not just efficiency and success. And this is the data from the expert registry, which you've just seen, and you can see that in hospital mace and a number of other uh, uh, complications were significantly increased in a primary retrograde approach. And you've got to remember the primary retrograde approach includes the, the bailout retrograde uh, complications as well. So we also have seen from multiple other registries that retrograde generally is associated with the highest risk of health complications. Now, there's a lot of debate about this. Is it because it's used in tougher cases? Uh, is it because people push the anti-grade and you get complications at anti-grade and you go to rich grade and it's included in rich grade? So there is debate. But I think there is concern uh, about the overall safety of this. And if we then translate that to less experienced people, are we going to see more complications? Last year, uh, Manus led this, this work and published the global consensus uh, expert uh, document and really, uh, I think, again, another landmark uh, publication talking about general principles that we all agreed on uh, about how uh, CTO PCI should optimally be performed. So in conclusion, uh, I think while there's a number of CTO principles, there remains a number of uh, questions. Is it important to start with the strategy with the highest risk, uh, chance of success? Can we better define uh, when we should switch strategies? How safe is rich grade? Is target ADR safe in rich grade or vice versa? Should the approach depend on the skill of the operator? I think these questions are, uh, you may get very different answers where you ask uh, people on the different side of the Atlantic. Um, and in the end, I think we need to get consensus um, and move towards a global CTO algorithm if we're going to uh, create clarity rather than confusion. Thank you. And so we will go to the next speaker, Dr. Yasumi Igarashi, and title is uh, Update Japanese Toolbox for the Complex City of PCI. Dr. Igarashi. Right. Uh, as you know, uh, we have two major uh, uh, City of PCI strategy. One is a hybrid strategy, and another one is uh, APCTO CTO algorithm, I think. And big difference between uh, two strategies, uh, okay? APCTO club algorithm, including IBUS guided uh, procedure. And uh, Japanese uh, new algorithm also uh, including IBUS guided procedure. But this is uh, update uh, new uh, hybrid strategy uh, a few years ago. Uh, IBUS is also included. So in all uh, CTO algorithm, IBUS system is included. Uh, why IBUS is necessary in CTO PCI? Uh, this is a Japanese uh, CTO score system. As you know, blunt, uh, not a tapered uh, morphology is one of the very difficult CTO PCI uh, procedure uh, factor. And uh, recently, so many uh, CTO score is uh, showed. This is Richard score, also uh, blunt type. Uh, this factor is included. And uh, this is progress CTO score, I think. Uh, CTO morphology, uh, entry uh, point morphology is very important like this. So, so many uh, CTO score and uh, score by score, uh, factor is very different. However, only proximal cap morphology is a common factor. And that means uh, CTO uh, entry point morphology is the most, one of the most important and uh, important factor to predict uh, procedure uh, diffic uh, difficulty, I think. So, uh, only method to identify correct entry point is IBAS system. So, probably everyone agrees at uh, this point. I want to show you the one interesting case. Uh, this is RCA mid CTO case. I treated in this case CCT uh, 2006, four years ago. Uh, brand type entry point and uh, proximal strong torture still like this. Uh, probably uh, entry point is here and bridge collateral and no promising intervention collateral. Uh, very tough case, I think. 
Uh, this case, I started anti-grade approach first, and of course I check I was finding. However, a very difficult to identify correct entry point. And I started anti-grade wiring. However, unfortunately, uh, this guide wire advanced to the false lumen like this. And I switched to the retrograde approach in this case. However, AC channel is so uh, complicated morphology and very difficult to uh, pass through. And I checked all uh, candidate, septal candidate. However, our septal connection is uh, very difficult to pass through. So I back to the anti-grade approach and this is parallel wire technique. However, also failed to get this uh, true lumen. And finally, uh, I check, uh, I try, uh, I bus guided rewiring like this. And fortunately, uh, I was cassette uh, search the proximal torchasty and uh, guide wire control is possible. And uh, under the direct observation uh, I was finding, I could navigate uh, second wire to the, uh, into the plug and uh, easily pass through to this uh, true lumen. And this is the final result. Uh, this result is very happy uh, for patient and also for me. However, problem is the procedure time. Total procedure time is over five hours. But after uh, I was guided rewiring only 30 minutes uh, until successful uh, result. So if you start this procedure uh, more early timing, uh, I can save four hour, four hour procedure time. Uh, based on algorithm of CT crossing, uh, I was guided uh, wiring is the last result of uh, after all procedures failed. However, uh, I uh, personally disagree uh, this uh, algorithm, I think. So my uh, style is recently different. Uh, this is my uh, algorithm. Integrated CT wire position is if false lumen. False lumen uh, means no connection with distal true lumen. So sometimes inside of a plaque, uh, sometimes uh, subintimal space. In this situation, I strongly recommend to uh, check IPAS examination. And if uh, position is inside of a plaque, uh, inside of a um, plaque, uh, integrated guide wire control is possible. So uh, I continue uh, integrated wiring like this. And uh, if uh, this I was finding is false lumen, uh, very difficult to pass through uh, the entry to this uh, true lumen. So another strategy is necessary. The one is a uh, little bit of approach, another one is a rewiring or sometimes ADR. I want to several, uh, show you several samples. This is RCA double CTO case. Uh, this is a simultaneous injection. Okay, entry point is here and uh, island is detected and uh, double CTO case. I started this case uh, integrated wiring first, and the first wire is XTA. However, this wire go to the uh, false lumen, and in this situation, I immediately check uh, I was finding. But however, uh, this wire is inside of black, so guide wire controls is possible. So I changed uh, and so uh, intra black. So I continue integrated wiring. The guide wire changed to the nail three gram, and this guide wire is uh, controllable and uh, fortunately get uh, island like this. And uh, this part is I tried uh, the basket technique, and this is the final result like this. This is another case RCA proximal CTO without interventional collateral, very very poor collateral, and entry point is here like this. And this is LAO cranial view, also uh, no promising collateral route like this. Entry is here. Okay, uh, in this case, I started uh, integrated wiring. Uh, initial wire is miracle nail, three gram. However, very difficult to penetrate uh, puncture and switch to the XT. XT is possible to advance inside of CT region. However, uh, chip direction is, uh, looks not so good. So uh, in this timing, I switched to the uh, IBAS uh, examination. Wire position is in uh, subintimal space like this. So uh, this case is, uh, okay, okay, sorry, uh, subintimal space. This case is no interventional collateral. So 
later we approach it looks very difficult. And uh, in, okay, just sorry. No interventional collateral and uh, two options, ADR or uh, IBAS guided rewiring. However, no distal clear targets, so only one method is IBAS guided rewiring. And uh, I started uh, rewiring by using uh, NEOS 3 gram. And fortunately, uh, I could navigate second wire to the uh, correct direction like this. And uh, I changed guide wire. Uh, this uh, NEOS 3 gram get this true lumen smoothly like this and go to the side branch and change to the uh, Sion black guide wire and I could get this true lumen. In this case, I skip, of course, little grade approach or parallel wire technique. And this is a uh, final result, uh, very excellent uh, result, I think. And this is another case, LED OCR CDO case, completely non stamp case. And uh, I was guided and by using a dual lumen catheter, by using uh, Conquest 820, uh, successfully I could uh, penetrate uh, an entry point like this. And I observed, I was finding of entry point. Uh, fortunately, the guide wire is inside the plug. However, more distal part, uh, this guide wire advanced to the behind of calcium. So uh, from this situation, I tried uh, I was guided rewiring, however, very difficult. And no chance of retrograde approach. But this case is uh, distal target is very big. So uh, this case is subintimal space and uh, no interventional collateral and very uh, good distal target. So very good indication of ADR. So I use a stingray system and uh, I delivered a stingray and a slow, a with slow technique and very easily I could puncture like this a true lumen by ADR system. And this is the final result. Uh, why we hesitate uh, to use IBAS guided rewiring? Uh, the reason is the potential risk to induce uh, subintimal hematoma progression, I think. And another reason is the complex preparation. Eight guiding catheter is uh, necessary, and uh, two millimeter pre dilatation is necessary uh, for, and uh, IBAS selection is sometimes a uh, limitation, I think. However, I think unsuccessful parallel wire techniques uh, also involve the same potential risk. So uh, my concept is uh, if entry point is a tapered entry and short region, uh, big distal target, such a case is I skip IBAS examination. However, uh, entry point uh, finding or a long region or for a distal target, uh, these cases, I strongly recommend to check IBAS finding first. And uh, IBAS catheter selection is also very important. Uh, usually, a short chip is better, but eagle eye system is uh, uh, very bulky, so sometimes delivery is difficult. And uh, in Japan, uh, this uh, system is available. However, in foreign countries, uh, long chip, uh, and, uh, usually uh, this system is not necessary. So uh, most, most commonly used system, commonly used system is obstacle system, however, very long chip. And in this situation, my favorite and original technique is a handmade uh, sort of chip uh, IBA system. Uh, this system is very useful in foreign countries, uh, IBAS guided rewiring procedure. Okay, and this obscurosis is also available easily for IBAS guided rewiring. Okay, uh, this is algorithm city crossing. Uh, in this algorithm, IBAS guided rewiring is a, a last result, but I disagree this uh, situation. If we go to the subintimal space, uh, immediately we should check IBAS finding and decide next procedure. That is more reasonable and uh, more easy to get final result, I, I believe. And this is my conclusion. IBAS guided rewiring is not a last resort. IBAS is only method to confirm CTO entry point uh, position on site. If integrated CTO wire position uh, detected in false lumen, 
immediate subsequent IBAS examination is helpful to determine next, next appropriate strategy. Early timing IBAS examination might contribute to procedure time saving. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Last speaker, Dr. Alun. And the contemporary ADR and the evaluation, evolution of the device and techniques. Alun, please. So I'm just going to go over the basics of ADR, what has changed in the last couple of years, and uh, maybe you know finish up with a case. So I think you know it's critical to emphasize, um, especially I think in the Asia Pacific region, that uh, you need to know what you can wire. And ADR is not a substitute for good wiring skills or for good CTO techniques. And it's important for us to know when to switch strategies. And uh, so I mean I've run into situations in India. Um, where I was told that this is going to be an ADR case, but then we ended up having to parallel wire. So these are not mutually exclusive techniques. And Dr. Igarashi just talked about IWAS guided wiring. It's important for people to be comfortable in multiple techniques. Um, but ADR is part of the algorithm because long lesions cannot be consistently wired even by world renowned experts. And sometimes there are no viable retrograde options. And again, this is a slide that you guys might have seen before. It's like two wires tend to go straight and knuckle wires tend to follow the vessel architecture. So that's always an important concept and I think people need to be aware of that. Um, and, and if you think about the bottom line is, uh, you get a knuckle wire into the subintimal space, get a cross cross catheter typically to form a more controlled knuckle and then you use a dedicated re-entry system which is the stingray, micro, uh, stingray balloon catheter to re-enter into the true lumen. And uh, you know the, this is uh, the hybrid algorithm, and Manos is here who published the initial paper. Uh, so typically, when you start anti-grade, and when it's not a, um, an easily wireable CTO lesion, that's kind of my functional definition. I think the 20 millimeters is uh, arbitrary. The idea is, can you wire it efficiently, or can you not? And if the answer is you can't, then use ADR as primary strategy. And and if it's uh, if you start wiring and if the wiring fails, then use it as a secondary strategy. And uh, again, the, the, the good part is that I think ADR has also made its way into a lot of the contemporary algorithms, including the APCT algorithm, where when you start with an anti-grade wire-based approach, and if there's a suitable re-entry zone, uh, it's okay to consider uh, cross bus stingray. Uh, and the, the kind of there's a bifurcation, either go this way or you go, go ahead and do parallel wiring. And uh, also there's a place for knuckle when there's an ambiguous course in the CTO, if it's tortuous, if it's heavily calcified, and uh, a long lesion, which again, not functionally efficient in wiring, and or an expert before has tried to wire it and failed. And uh, <clears throat> this is courtesy Manos. Uh, typically, I mean, it can be broken down to the following steps. You wanna get something to the proximal cap and then um, you got to get get your gear to the re-entry zone after you're in the CTO segment. And really where you want to be is, is uh, in one of those places. And let me just go to the next slide and then show it to you in a bit. So that's the cross boss. And here's the atraumatic tip. We use it less these days. This is just my fingers here. As you can see, the idea is that it's a control knuckle. It's just a one millimeter knuckle. And uh, proximal cap, get there and then a couple of finger breaths off, and then you spin really fast, unlike Cronus or other uh, microcatheters. And uh, remember, cross balls only works if the proximal cap is tapered. If many times you've got to penetrate with the penetration wire and then switch to a knuckle wire. And uh, you can cross the CTO segment itself with a knuckle or with a cross balls. And you really want to be in positions four or five. The one critical thing that I would say when you're doing ADR is you want to disconnect the syringe once you get into the subintimal space because inadvertently you don't want to inject anti-grade. And uh, like I said, the dissection itself can happen either with a boss or a knuckle. And we used to tell people dogmatically, you got to finish with a cross boss if you knuckle a wire. Why? Because the idea was that uh, you know when you form a knuckle, many times it's uncontrolled, it's large and you have a much bigger subintimal space. And so the true lumen is more compressed. Uh, in, in, in contrary, when you use a cross boss, the subintimal space is much smaller and the true lumen is bigger. So you have a bigger target. And uh, again, just in comparison, you know, smaller target, bigger target. And so intuitively it made sense that if you're gonna knuckle, finish with the boss. 
Now, again, this is from a few years ago. So, so the key is to spin it fast. And, and remember, cross pause tends to go straight. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tool with a strength and a weakness. So it can find side branches. There are concerns about perforation of the boss. The key is to know if you're at a side branch. Typically, that's what happens uh, when you do get a big perf because you didn't realize you were inadvertently in a side branch. And then the Stingray balloon catheter is a balloon catheter that's designed for reentry. So you're either going to reenter here or here in one of the two ports. And these two ports are 180 degrees opposite each other. So this over the wire balloon, get it to the reentry zone and then pick the right port. Fairly intuitive. And uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, just into four minutes into it. So, um, so for those people that are not familiar with the Stingray preparation, use a Luvalox syringe, 20 ml, a good negative prep. So I tend to do it two or three times. And so when you have a good vacuum, typically what happens is that uh, the, the, the syringe just pops in a little bit. So that's just a way of checking. So the goal is to, once you're in the re-entry zone, to re-enter with this after you've prepped it well. And uh, so here you are. It's, and we advance the Stingray balloon catheter over a miracle gross wire, typically because it's a stiff wire all the way to the tip. It's those two markers that are going out there. And it's a one person job. So you really want to hold the wire with your right hand and advance with your left. And you can see it there. And uh, so once you're there, you re enter. If all fails, do an investment procedure, don't stent it. And uh, this is a good view. This is a bad view. You don't want to see the wings of the balloon. You just want to see one line and two dots. And uh, this is what we call as a stick. We used to use a stingray wire always for it. And I'll tell you what has changed in the last few years. So you will see a big splay from, from the balloon itself. So you make the stick, a couple of sticks, and then what happens outside the body when you see it is that it goes through one of the side ports. So I don't know if you can see it there. So that's typically how it goes. And, uh, you know, for the most part, what we do is we stick and we swap it out for a polymer uh, jacketed hydrophilic wire, often the uh, Pilot 200 for this. And uh, let me just show you that real quick. So that's the Pilot 200 coming in. You go, it, and this is almost a feel of no feel. You're in the true lumen. And once you're here, you want to confirm with the retrograde injection that you're in the true lumen. And uh, the rest is angioplasty. You exchange for a workforce where I do it. What has changed in the last couple of years is that we are using smaller, I mean, especially in Asia, seven French guides are, the, are, are kind of the default. Uh, the Stingray LP, which is a low profile Stingray balloon catheter, is compatible with six, but I highly recommend seven French. Uh, we used to typically, like when I started, like use cross boss a lot and oftentimes sort of back up. Now, these days, cross boss is really just to finish it if you use it at all. Um, we always used to do cross boss before Stingray initially. These days, I think the usage has come down a lot. It's moved from Stingray to LP, as I said. We always used to re enter with a Stingray wire. A whole host of wires can be used in uh, today. You can use the Stingray wire, uh, the CP820, CP12, Hornet 14, Gaia 3rd, Gaia 3rd next, whatever you got. And we used to all use stick and go initially. These days, what you do is you stick, swap it, or you do stick and drive with one of the other wires, not the stingray wire typically. And initially, we used to manage with hematoma and perform straw only if we had difficulty 
with hematoma and there was a difficulty visualizing the distal vessel. These days, the emphasis on upfront management. So we don't have trap liner in India, but in those parts of the world, including the US where you have it, I think most of them have kind of evolved into managing hematoma religiously. And uh, we do sometimes tend to use guided screening catheters. And the key is manage your hematoma, don't let it develop and then kind of follow through, uh, get into a problem. Uh, so I got like two more minutes. So just gonna kind of go over this. There are problems which you can encounter, but there are solutions to it. And I think we have a whole wealth of experience. Uh, and then of course, we don't really use wire-based ADR much anymore unless it's an investment procedure. Initially, we just used to go to the easiest part, like the, the, the flat area, uh, the juiciest vessel, and uh, I think maybe a little bit more cavalier about how far we went before we re-entered. These days, I think with improving techniques and experience, we are able to re-enter right after the CTO segment, minimizing the subentimal space really. And you have operators from all over the world um, and, and, you know, like I said, the long plus is really the functional definition. I think uh, I borrowed that from APCTO club and uh, there are operators all across the globe these days. So I think I have one more, two more minutes. So I'll just show you a quick case. This is a case that I did with another uh, expert in a live case. As you can see, this is a uh, circumflex CTO, ambiguous cap, distal cap is, I mean, the landing zone is okay. Uh, but not great. Collaterals, we didn't really see any. We thought maybe, maybe not. Uh, so the plan was wire escalation after IBIS entry. If that didn't work, go retrograde. If that didn't go work, go ADR. So IBIS identification of the proximal cap was done successfully. So you can see around uh, 10, 11 o'clock that penetration was good. But then came all the trouble. Long amount of time spent attempting to wire, lots of wires used, nothing worked. I mean, I can, uh, the, the CINI runs will just show you that we had significant difficulty in wiring it. And, uh, but again, given that we were from two different schools of thought, there was some hesitation in, in knuckling anti-gray. And uh, we also briefly tried retrograde, no retrograde options at all. So failed anti-gray wire escalation, no retro option. So I'm gonna, uh, because I don't have much time, I'm gonna skip these two slides that I borrowed from Dr. Lombardi who showed this to show that knuckles are pretty safe and don't exit the vessel architecture. But then uh, finally, kind of the decision was made that uh, we would knuckle. And uh, once we knuckle, and, and here again, we didn't use guide extension catheters. I didn't use a cross pass. In fact, I took the, the knuckle further down in the architecture of the vessel, took the caravel that was already on the table, exchanged, uh, um, put in the Miracle 12, and then took down the uh, Stingray balloon catheter over the Miracle wire. As you can see, that's being advanced here. So that's coming down. And based on the prior angiogram, we knew we were before the bifurcation. And uh, again, for people that are fairly new, wrong orientation, good orientation. One line, two dots, you don't want to see the wings. And uh, initial stick and swap didn't work. And as you can see, I don't even know where I'm going. And, uh, but again, you know, ended up making our own bend. I think this was a Conquest Pro 12 or this Confianza Pro 12 as it's called in the West. Uh, so I ended up doing a blind stick and drive. And this was actually on the dot 30 minutes since we decided to knuckle. And uh, kind of had to do this by field, but this is a more advanced ADR. And once this was done, Crusade, exchange for a workhorse wire and uh, secured the other branch with the same dual lumen catheter and confirmed by Iris that we were true lumen and got both branches. You can see it come around 12, one o'clock, true lumen, true lumen. And then you will see a little bit of subintimal here and then more proximally it was true lumen. Okay. And then that's the final result post uh, stenting. So anyways, uh, in conclusion, I think in this particular case, early switch to ADR would have been good. Not every lesion can be wired and knuckling is often useful. And uh, my conclusion slide, I think ADR continues to be an important CTO technique uh, adopted world over. Have a game plan before every case. ADR can be done either as primary or as a secondary strategy. The technique itself is evolving and has changed a lot in the last, you know, less than 10 years. Uh, managing hematoma continues to be key. And if you decide to do ADR, do it sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, good participate of the discussion each other so it is very important to the many uh, algorithms 
algorithm was already reported from the uh, all over the world. But I think an important issue is how and when the switch to the another uh, strategies uh, from the anti grade to the retrograde and IBAS guide and the stingray area. And uh, so that is a very important uh, timing. So uh, everybody uh, is a very uh, expert of the city of operators. How did how do you thinking about this, uh, the timing of the, based on the uh, algorithm? Um, so, um, very thanks uh, for all four lectures. Um, uh, in terms of that question, I really agree with Dr. Harding that um, if you become an expert, you develop your own algorithm, which uh, um, Dr. Igarashi um, uh, shown us uh, for his own. So, uh, but still, uh, we need to focus on uh, those, um, uh, not only for the experts, for the beginners and uh, intermediate users of the CTO PCI. So in terms of that, um, I would like to um, make some comment with uh, a new algorithm, Japanese algorithm. Uh, uh, a new finding was that they uh, proposed a 20 minute limitation of uh, uh, integrated wire escalation. And um, for me, I think it's quite reasonable, although it is uh, quite arbitrary. Um, the thing we have to know that I think is that um, the, the, the uh, 20 minute um, limitation was derived from uh, the, the patients that um, ultimately had a successful integrated PCI. That means that um, uh, 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 for those cases, there may have been some progress during that 20 minutes. So uh, uh, actually um, we have to adopt very flexible for our procedure for that 20 minutes because um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you even uh, reach to that 20 minutes and you have some progress then you can keep on going on or unless uh, if you have only 15 minutes of wiring you don't have any progress then it's wiser to switch over to another strategy. And another thing is that um, in Japanese um, registry, they did not uh, uh, actively use the ADR technique. So if you're going to integrate wiring and you have a 17 mile wire um, positioning and there's a good indication of an ADR, just switch it to the ADR, that's a more um, 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 wise strategy, I think. So it's really important to uh, uh, make a flexible um, limit of, of, of your own, but still I think that's 20 minutes is quite reasonable uh, for me, uh, but um, for the audience and the general CTO operators, I think it would be uh, important to uh, think that um, aspect when you interpret that um, data. Yeah, I agree that uh, a 20 minute uh, limitation is uh, arbitrary. So it's based on uh, analysis. And I totally agree that if you have made some progress, maybe you can uh, prolong your, your work on uh, one method for a longer time, but you have achieved nothing or maybe a potential complication, maybe you need to uh, switch to other uh, method more quickly. So I think the, the basic is that, uh, the concept is that a CTO is basically a dynamic game. It's a dynamic game, meaning that when you are doing something at the back of your head, you have to be prepared for your next move. Uh, and you have to think about uh, what your current move will affect your next move. I think that is very important. So comparing anti-gray, retrograde, wire escalation, ADR, I think these are all basic tools that you need to have uh, in order to have a successful, efficient, and safe procedure. So for the primary or beginners, I think sometimes this will be overwhelming. So let's, if we want to give them an algorithm to follow, we should focus on the safety first, I think. For the expert, you will develop your own favor, your style or your favor of skills. But uh, uh, as an algorithm to be teachable, I think uh, the first concept is that this is a dynamic game. Secondly, we want to provide them with the, the, the safer uh, method as the first. Uh, but as anyone who wants to be uh, uh, established or developed in this area, we should get acquainted with all these different types of techniques. I think that's that's my comment. 
How do you think about the power of wire techniques, including in the 20 minutes or uh, the 20 minutes by escalation plus power of wire techniques? How do you think about that? I don't yes. think you should include the parallel wire in the 20 minutes. I agree with everything Paul said. I think you know what we're learning is that this should be a very dynamic process um, and we shouldn't become too wedded to one strategy. So what I was alluding to is, I don't think it's really important to start that your first strategy has to be the successful strategy. Um, and I think the consistent CTO data showed that, you know, there was a lot of swapping, a lot of success. Um, and, you know, I, I would congratulate Dr. Maramatsu and his um, colleagues, because we've talked about this for a long time, trying to define when the best time to switch is not an easy task. Um, and I think the 20 minutes, you know, like any algorithm, it's a guideline. It's not a, something you should be wedded to. But I think it's a, uh, should wear a flag, if you like. If you get to 20 minutes and you're making no progress and you haven't swapped, you need to swap. But like Paul said, before you start the procedure, you need to have analysed it and realised, well, is this my only option? You know, are there other good options? How good are they? And depending on how good your other options are, is obviously going to depend on where you, when you swap. So like me, frequently I'll look at a case and say, well, you know, I think this is a rich grade case. My personal preference is to start with anti-grade preparation most of the time. And, you know, sometimes um, the wire goes, you know, and I'm not talking about stiff wires. I'm talking about, you know, the Pilot 200. It's a relatively safe wire. If, it, if, if that works, it's the quickest, safest, most efficient strategy. But literally I'll spend two, three, five minutes doing that because I know I've got a good strategy and the actual overall success rate of integrated wiring is going to be low. Um, very different if I have a 25 millimeter lesion uh, with no other adverse factors, I'm gonna really think that, you know, I should be doing integrated wiring. Here. Well, I must say I agree as well with um, like what Paula Scott said. And uh, one of the challenges, however, in my mind is that people or the operator usually does not really take a timer and say, okay, I've been 15, 16, 17 minutes. So sometimes the problem is you get forgo you get lost into this mode of trying and you lose uh, the sense of time. So I don't know if it would be useful, like we do with radiation and contrast, to have potentially the technician say, look, you've been 20 minutes, do you need to do something different? Because some operators, especially early in their learning curve, they may have a hard time keeping track of time. They may lose the sense of timing. Right. Because after the publication of that Japanese paper, you know, actually I um, tested my own procedure with a stopwatch. And um, <laughs> my, my colleagues or my, um, you know, uh, uh, friends, you know, they tested me. And um, in my field, in 20 minutes, really short, you know. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, I, 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 in my field, it was on 10, 10 minutes, but already 20 minutes. So uh, I agree with Manus that it's, um, it's quite um, uh difficult to implement uh, in your procedure. 20 minutes is not that easy. I think that you can change the time limitation because it's a, depending on the case, it's a, each situation is a very different. And also the operator skill is different. So some beginner need to the more, 20 more, 20, 20 minutes more. So maybe you can use the, the sometimes you can use a more 20, 20 minutes. Yeah, but what I'm talking about is that um, I think uh, the uh, the time limit is uh, is important, but uh, if you want to, you know, use some time limitation for your procedure, then it's hard for you to calculate it. You you need some assistance. You know, it's really hard uh, to. So I, I think the concept shouldn't be a time limit. It should more be that if you reach that time, it should be a flag. Should I keep doing what I'm doing or should I have changed or is now the time to change? It's very hard to make a hard, fast time limit because every case is different, you know, and uh, everyone's got different skills. But I think, you know, having some sort of, you know, we run this for 20 minutes, you know, should I really think about changing at this point is a, is a, is a good thing. Okay, one comment. Uh, for example, uh, parallel wire technique procedure time 
if um, parallel wire technique, uh, second guide wire position is in sub-intimal space, uh, that parallel wire technique is uh, harmful, no meaning, no benefit. So five minutes is too long. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, if inside of a uh, plug, uh, very, very meaningful, so uh, operator should continue uh, this wiring over sometimes 30 minutes. So uh, we cannot distinguish, yeah, this strategy is effective or not. Sometimes IBUS is very helpful to decide uh, correct appropriate procedure. That is my uh, concept. So, so I, uh, yeah. I was uh, fascinated by your talk. It was, uh, it was very good. And I think it is uh, an example how experts evolve their own technique and style. And obviously, uh, what you said made a lot of sense and, uh, and has been very successful for you. I think, but again, it sort of does depend on your skill set. Um, for example, a lot of people uh, don't feel comfortable interpreting the IBIS images uh, for IBIS guided re-entry, um, don't have a lot of experience with it. And I guess you know, some of the reluctance for people who are involved in ADR is, you know, the, the teaching now is you want to minimize uh, inflow and, of course, by dilating with a balloon to get the IBIS down, you're enlarging inflow. So if you want to do ADR with Stingray, perhaps uh, you may be making life more difficult for yourself. I, I, I do have a question for you because I, I, it was a very good talk. So when you are sub-interval and uh, you want to use wire-based re-entry with IBIS guidance, uh, which wire do you prefer and what shape do you make? Sorry, uh, did, I was just saying, when you were doing uh, wire-based free entry, when you were sub-intimal, uh, which wire do you prefer and uh, which shape do you make? Uh, of course, a wire choice is sometimes, sometimes very important. However, more important point is uh, how to identify the, from which point uh, first wire enter to the sub-intimal space. And the second guide uh, should be uh, placed proximal of uh, sub-intimal uh, sub space entered point. And the uh, point is very uh, stiff, so tapered, uh, high penetration power, power wire is necessary. And sometimes angulated position, uh, more to controllable guide wire is necessary. So uh, uh, case by case, very difficult to answer situation is a case by case, very different and different. Very sorry. Well, usually the, we need to the very big car according to the vessel size. So I usually the, I make it the shape with the uh, fast fast curve shape uh, size is uh, almost the vessel size according to the IBAS. Yeah, uh, usually a big curve is necessary. For example, for RCACTO. Yeah, sure. Can I ask you a question? I know the Miracle Neo you mentioned. There's some new wires we're not familiar with, at least in the U.S. part of the world. Um, uh, do, you, do you use those now more in compared to the Gaia's, or has the have things are changing in terms of your wires um, choices for undergrade uh, escalation? Yeah, yeah, Gaia is a very good choice. However, uh, very very useful only uh, guide wire uh, wire position is inside of a plug. If Gaia is in, uh, inside of sub intimal space. Control is impossible. So usually, uh, no work. Wire series is no work, I think. Anyway, important point, uh, integrated wiring, uh, joining wiring, uh, wire position must be inside of a plug. That is a key point, I think, for integrated wire escalation. So okay. may yeah. I? So I think uh, you guys just had made a very interesting comment. I think this, this is also a comment back to Scott's question. When you uh, ask Igarashi Sensei that uh, when the wire is in subintimal space, using an IVAS to guide wire re-entry, how do you shape your wire? Correct. That was your question, right, Scott? Sure. But I, but I, but I think with the IVAS, if you can identify where the first wire exit the plug into the sub, then you can use a second wire actually to keep yourself within the plug. So it's not actually IVAS guided re-entry, but IVAS guided reposition of your second wire so that you want to stay within the plug and then you can continue to use something like a Gaia to, to have a better uh, intra-plug 
Yeah, yeah, open solution. Yeah, uh, yeah. Kind of necessary. Yeah, uh, very useful. Yeah. I guess the difficulty for that is if that point is still a long way from the distal CTO cap, or you have a lot of calcification or tortuosity in between, it's still going to be very difficult to achieve that wiring. Yeah, but then if you can somehow place your second wire in the plug and then maybe knuckle your way through. I mean, knuckle within the plug, maybe it's better than knuckle in the subindimal space, especially if you are creating a large hematoma and then you lose your next step because you're, you're you, you, I mean, the following parallel wiring, the following ADR would be extremely difficult. Yeah. So now, now uh, we change into the, the rage width approach. So if you have uh, the uh, very, the simple, uh, the septal channel is okay, but uh, uh, if you have a very tortuous, ungraded epicardial channel, sometimes it's difficult to overcome. So what should you do in the, uh, how did you cross the, uh, the tortuous, the epicardial channels? Professor Koch, uh, okay. Kao? Yeah. yeah, okay. So I think that you have asked, uh, I think one last missing piece of the big puzzle. Here. We talked about algorithms, we talked about approaches, but in all these algorithms, you only mentioned interventional channel. <laughs> so what is the definition of an interventional channel? It's so variable, depending on the uh, available devices, depending on the operator skills and experiences. So I think that is our last missing piece of the puzzle. Um, I think with the improvement of the devices and concept, I think there will be more and more usable uh, channels for operators. But then we have to define which one is should be the first one we, we want to use, which one is safer, which one is more efficient and bring you a, a better success. And that is why I think uh, collectively, maybe we should try to develop some kind of a retrograde scoring system for the operators to, to understand which one to start with. Uh, intuitively, we, are, we all understand that epicardio sounds very dangerous because if you perforate those, you will have hematoma, uh, you will have a tamponade and you have to deal with that. But uh, like I always mentioned, septo is not necessarily always safe. So I think um, uh, there should be a consensus on which channel to choose to start and to begin with. Well, I think that's a great point. Actually, there is a J channel score that's been developed recently, and we're increasingly starting to use that. And that might be one way to kind of give a number to the collaterals. I know there's a lot of personal, obviously, subjective assessment, but that might actually help choose the best one to start with and have a plan. If it doesn't work, you go to the next one and so on and so forth. But I agree with you. Uh, this remains probably one of the least defined areas. And obviously, in your hands, uh, in the hands of this panel, things can happen very effectively, even in very complex uh, collaterals. But for the majority of operators, these very complex collaterals probably should remain out of their reach because if you don't experience other techniques, you go to this very complex, you get a complication, you probably didn't serve the patient the best. Yeah. No, I think those are great points, guys. I mean, the, the, the one thing that I didn't want to add to, to this wonderful discussion uh, is that, you know, in parts of the world, I think outside of the U.S., and perhaps, I mean, I see it a lot more in South Asia and Southeast Asia, it's very hard to get your assistant to speak up or to empower your nurses. It's a common theme that I try to uh, talk to people about. That's one thing that I didn't want to mention. So I think what Dr. Lee was talking about, policing yourself is very critical. And uh, secondly, like, you know, uh, in terms of having dogmatic time limits on saying, okay, I'm going to, I think we, you got to tailor it to the case. You got to tailor it to the operator, what's in your skill set. And, you know, and, and then kind of try and hold yourself true to it. So it's very hard, I think, to have like hard times and say, okay, you're going to do this only for 20 minutes across the board, across all geographies, across all patients. Okay, so uh, all of us, the uh, time is all already. Yeah, I think we're across the time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any other, the final, final comments? The Harding, final comment, please. Well, I'd just like to thank everyone for their fantastic presentations, and uh, it was great to have the opportunity to be involved in this. I think you know these are ongoing discussions. We've defined some of the problems. We don't have all the answers yet, and uh, but uh, I think we will work together. We'll make further progress towards that. 
Great seeing everyone. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.